medical patients, be they um, all adult patients, be they medical, surgical or trauma patients, will be seen by the specialty of emergency medicine. So it'll be emergency medicine doctors who will be the first doctor to see such patients are in, in many cases we've advanced nurse practitioners working with us. In the case of children, it still remains a disparate service. So you have medical pediatric patients being seen by pediatrics and you have pediatric surgical patients or trauma patients being seen by emergency medicine. And that is the majority scenario, although there are some exceptions. My own hospital in Sligo, uh, Cork University Hospital are examples of hospitals where emergency medicine deals with all comers. And I would suggest to you that in, in the model that is in use in many departments around the country, there is potential for disaster. Uh, just because you have abdominal pain doesn't mean that you necessarily have a surgical problem and there are many medical causes of abdominal pain, some of which are particularly serious. Now, as Fiona has said, triage is a core feature of emergency medicine internationally. And in Ireland, we have typically used the Manchester triage system, which was introduced to Ireland in the mid 80s, and it was incrementally introduced. So I, I can remember when we had a triage service from eight o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock in the evening, then it went midnight, and then ultimately it became 24 seven. And it's probably fair to say that it became universal on a 24 7 365 basis by 2012. Now, there are many characteristics of a good triage system, but among those has to be the ability to identify those in greatest need for care, which means that we should be able to identify the sickest patients using the triage system. And as a corollary of that, that should also help us to be able to predict disposition. So it follows from that, that patients who are in triage category one should be much more likely to need ICU admission or admission in general than, than patients in triage category five. Now the problem with Manchester triage in a pediatric emergency medicine scenario is that it's the equivalent of putting a Ferrari engine into a tractor and wondering why it doesn't perform. Essentially, it's an adult system that pediatrics was an add-on to it. it there, are, there have been three iterations of it, and the number of specific pediatric flowcharts has increased over time, but it's still relatively paltry. And what it's missing from it is age-related vital signs. We all know that a one-year-old's heart rate and a 10-year-old's heart rate are likely to be different. And therefore, an elevated heart rate in a 10-year-old might be entirely normal in a one-year-old. There's also evidence when it comes to Manchester that the acuity of pediatric presentations tends to be compared inaccurately in mixed departments because people are by and large familiar with, with triaging adults and therefore make some inappropriate comparisons. It's also, as I'll show you in the next few slides, a poor predictor of disposition. So we have examples of patients who receive a triage category five, which suggests that they really shouldn't be in the emergency department in the first place, and yet they've ended up in a pediatric intensive care unit. So there was a recognition of that and a group of consultants in pediatric emergency medicine and nurses in, in the pediatric emergency departments and in the mixed emergency departments decided that they would do something about that. And Bridget Conway, who I see is on, on the call, was, was one of the main drivers for this. But the decisions that were made were that a five level scale made more sense. There's lots of evidence to show that three point scales, which are in use in certain countries, are not as good discriminators as five point scales. And what was done was that we looked at, or the group looked at, the best of what was available internationally and Pilot is a variation of that, which took into consideration vital signs for appropriate, as appropriate to the age of the child. Now, it was crucially important in this that it was piloted not just in the pediatric emergency departments who only see children, but in, in three mixed emergency departments. In this case, it was Cork, Galway and Drogheda. And the performance of the triage system and the performance of people performing it was audited. Now that was not an overnight process. It took a lot of time and effort uh, 
to actually bring it to completion. And, and the process started in approximately 2011, 2012, and finished with the production of the document that you can see on the right hand side of the screen in 2016. It's currently undergoing revision and Carol Blackburn will speak to that later. Now, interestingly, if you look, so so this is work from Bridget Conway and her colleagues, but if you look at this, so the, the six hospitals, the three pediatric hospitals are on the left and the three mixed departments are on the right. And this, this shows admitted patients and their emergency department triage category. And you can see that in general, that the higher the triage category, the more likely you are to be admitted. But yet there are people in triage category five that are being admitted to hospital. Now you might say, well, that's not a huge big deal, but you can see when ICTS was introduced and piloted that that performance improved. It didn't abolish completely the possibility of somebody in triage category five being admitted. What's more obvious is when you look at the admissions to pediatric intensive care and compare them with the triage categories and when they present it in the emergency department. And you'll see again on the left, the pie chart on the left shows you the position uh, using Manchester in the six hospitals. And you can see that worryingly, 2% of, of people in triage category four uh, ended up going to pediatric intensive care unit. In, in that particular hospital, and that doesn't make a lot of sense. Whereas with the implementation of ICTS, the, the pie chart on the right, you will see that if you were in triage category four or five using ICTS, you were not going to end up going to an intensive care unit. And generally speaking, the predictive value of uh, the triage category uh, fitted more appropriately with their ultimate disposal or disposition as probably a better word than disposal. So in terms of performance, uh, there is good reliability of this. In other words, that this, the same person triaging the same type of complaint on a number, a number of occasions is likely to com come up with the same answer. But equally, there is good intra-observer variability reduction. So there's very little intra-observer variability, which is important. It's also important to, to recognize that performance is broadly similar between pediatric emergency departments and mixed emergency departments. And so well received was this that the sites that piloted specifically applied to continue to use it after the pilot because they felt that it was more effective than Manchester and their personal experience was that it worked in their hands, which I think is particularly important. So I'm happy to take questions on this. I know there'll be, there'll be questions probably at the end in the panel discussion, um, but I'm more than happy to take questions uh, at, at a time of choosing of the chair. Well, thank you, Fergal. Uh, just on that, uh, how, what cutoff did you use between the paediatric uh, triage uh, and the Manchester and the adults? Was it the Six, usual 15, Six. 16? No, so it's it's so one of the things that happened as a result of the emergency medicine program was that the operational definition of pediatrics went to 16. So from up to a child 16th birthday, they are pediatric. Now legally, they may well be uh, deemed to be minors and pediatric up to the age of 18, but but the operational definition became 16. So if you're 16 years and older, you're an adult, and therefore Manchester is used. And if you're up to your 16th birthday, uh, you're regarded as paediatric. And and how did you did you look how the upper quartile uh, of the paediatric uh, how how good was that versus Manchester? Did it add anything compared to to Manchester? Yeah. So I think th the issue was that at the extremes of age, Manchester didn't perform well for paediatrics. So at the younger age group, but also at the adolescents. That was when it was at its weakest, and and that issue was addressed by the ICTS introduction. Oh, that's very useful. And last question: in those emergency departments where they were mixed, both adult and and children, were there difficulties in terms of documentation and personnel and knowing 
which to use and and and, and that kind of thing. Not really. Not after it became not after its launch and it became the norm. Um, emergency department nurses, as as Fiona uh, has said, have to have a certain amount of experience working in their departments before they're allowed to triage. It's not a skill that is. Uh, guaranteed on day one or uh, without the necessary experience. So, you know, once you d- determined that somebody was 16 or over, then uh, Manchester was applied. If they were up to the age of 16, then ICTS was applied. And for many of the uh, hospitals using IPMS, the uh, th- that patient administration system, then ICTS was actually built into it. So it was possible to triage electronically. And obviously the pediatric hospitals had access to their own systems and they could triage electronically as well. And that helped. Well, thank you, Fergal. I I think that uh, kind of segues into uh, Rory O'Brien's talk about how children and adult emergencies differ. Uh, So Rory, we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, Thank you very much Um, and I'd like to introduce myself and firstly say thank you to the chair and uh, it's an honour to present to everybody here today. Um, First slide please. So firstly I'd like to introduce myself. I'm new on the scene here in Ireland. I I was overseas for a number of years and I've taken post up in uh, Cork University Hospital uh, of March of last year. Uh, You know it seems like a long time ago now and I know a lot has happened in the meantime. Next slide. And I have to say um, this um, this goober actually does somewhat re- resemble me. <laughs> um, so uh, and I'd like to thank Heather McKay, who's from Positive Science, who, who did a lot of work, for, artwork for us. And we're hoping to build a new um, children's ED down here and we're going to use her artwork for that. Um, now, I, I was asked to uh, present in this talk and I, I have to admit I, I did cringe a little bit because, you know, in my role here, I'm a pediatric emergency medicine consultant in Cork and I also uh, work in the, the adult side of things as well. And I do spend a lot of my time talking about the similarities and adults and what you would do for an adult is essentially my mantra. But how, how differences why um, we need to approach differently, approach the triage in particular, which, which is what we're talking about tonight. And that's what I'd like to talk about. Next slide. So I think starting off, um, and it's been touched on a little bit, what is an, an emergency or definitions may for some but it's a serious, unexpected and often dangerous situation requiring immediate action. At least that's what's said in the Oxford Dictionary. Now, I think we can all agree that this is not all the emergencies we see. Um, A lot of them would not fit into this category. However, I'm sure if we were to do a straw poll in all the emergency department waiting rooms tonight, I think all the patients waiting would, would disagree. And we have to take this into account. So the question is really, how do we prioritize care for these patients? And why do we need to prioritise care? Next slide. So let's have a look at these two pictures here. So I've, I've taken these from APLS talks. So the child on the left, uh, I, I just want to untangle some concepts around triage uh, and I want to untangle the concept of seriousness and urgency. I think by looking at the child on the left, he or she is struggling for breath. There's quite significant sternal recession. That child looks scared. And I'm sure their parents are scared too, and possibly the people looking after that child are. I don't think anyone child needs to be seen first. If, now it's likely this child will get some nebulized adrenaline, some steroids, pick up, be discharged later tonight or more likely tomorrow morning. While the child on the right, albeit um, complaining of a headache, may have a, a serious underlying pathology like a, a tumor, for example. And I think once again, we can all agree that's a more serious and complex condition. So I think we could all agree that the child on the left needs to be seen urgently. So we we do need a a process whereby um, we can uh, deliver care um, appropriately and use the resources that are available to us. Next slide, please. But it's by no means under undermining our diminishing the seriousness or or complexity of the other patients who are waiting for us. I think there's an economic argument for triage. Um, For example, we will always have finite resources and we will never live in a system where we have uh, where we will be able to see every patient arriving at the front door of a hospital. First up, there will always be a a process of prioritization and that's essentially what triage does. 
but it does it in an equitable and transparent and accountable way. And that is the argument for having something like the ICTS. Next slide, please. And that is essentially, you know, I, th I think that is in, in keeping with what Slanta Care is trying is trying to do. Next slide. Now, once again, talking about children and the difference, differences between children and adults. Once again, children are not aliens. OK, they're and they're not a different species. Next slide. They're much more similar to you and me, OK? Uh, and I think there's lots of transferable skills that those of you who are looking predominantly after adults will have in caring for unwell children. Next slide, please. So these similarities include, you know, uh, th this list is by no means exhaustive, but in critical care for those extremely sick children, that's essentially medicine by numbers, medicine by kilos. The numbers are just a bit smaller. Your skills in crisis resource management and communication and prioritization, which is arguably the most important skill. And there's many transfer transferable procedural skills that you'll have. Next slide, please. Now, obviously, it, it would be remiss of me to, to ignore the differences. Next slide. Pathology obviously varies with age. So take, for example, this non-exhaustive list of causes of abdominal pain. A child, a two-year-old child complaining of abdominal pain is very different to a 12-year-old child. It's very different to a 50-year-old adult. And we have to take this into account. Next slide. Obviously, developmentally, um, you know, uh, you could we're all develop, we're all still developing, you, you know, me, me more than most. Um, but children obviously go through a period of rapid growth and development. Socially fine, gross motor. Verbal. They have milestones that they must meet, and it's important to take these into account. Their immune systems developing. We all know that a, a newborn, a neonate is at a much increased risk of serious infection. Next slide, please. Patterns of injury also differ substantially. Just picking two uh, systems, respiratory wise, their functional residual capacity is less, their closing volume is less, they have less res respiratory reserve. Cardiovascular, we all know that a child will maintain their blood pressure to the very bitter end. Heart rate is a much larger component of the cardiac output. So that's why we, sp we spend so much attention, pay mo so much attention to the heart rate. Next slide, please. We know in septic shock that uh, adults and children do present often quite differently. Adults with vasoplegic warm shock, while children will often present with maximal vasomotor tone and myocardial dysfunction presenting as a cold mottled child. Next slide, please. <coughs> I think one of the greatest differences who are used to looking after adults predominantly, but look after kids also, is the, the feeling of the sense of the unfamiliar. And I would argue for those paediatricians of you who are watching as I speak, uh, you would have a similar unease about looking after an adult. It's a sense of the un unfamiliar. But you must remember there are many transferable skills. And we can't forget the emotional aspect also. Next slide. I want to introduce, introduce a new law. <clears throat> it's called O'Brien's Law. And it basically states the age of the patient is inversely proportional to the number of people offering to help. Next slide, please. Or put another way, the age of the patient is inversely proportional to the chaos that is created. <clears throat> and I think we can all um, empathise with this statement. So not only are you managing an unwell child, you're also managing the crowd with an overlay of the emotional aspect. So what can we do? How can we approach this? I think we need systems of care. I think this is part of why the ICTS came into being, trying to put some manners on, on the chaos. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you very much. And I can answer any questions now or uh, later on, uh, whatever you think. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rory. Um, I think we'll probably move on and uh, we'll see what comes in on the uh, chat line. I, I haven't had any new questions come in on the chat line yet, so we have uh, 133 people uh, dialed in. So 
please do uh, feel free to type a message and we'll pick up on it and ask our participants. So I'm going to move on to Carl Blackburn. And Carl, thank you very much for uh, presenting this evening. And you're going to tell us about the second edition of ICTS. Uh, Carl. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thanks again for the opportunity to present uh, to you all at this webinar this evening. Uh, my name is Carol Blackburn. I'm a consultant in paediatric emergency medicine in Crumlin, and I've been in post here since 2012. So I have some experience, I suppose, of ICTS both in the pilot stage and also throughout the course of the first edition of the tool that we've been using. And I've also had some input into the second edition. Uh, next slide, please. So my task this evening is to speak to you about the additions that we've made uh, to the second edition. Um, and I'd also like to present um, some data to you based on data we've collected both from the paediatric ED setting and also from the mixed emergency departments that have been using the tool over the last six years, uh, because I think it speaks to the utility of the tool and the generalizability also. Um, next slide, please. So um, really it was quite heartening to see um, when reviewing the first edition and taking feedback um, from the users around the country, that there really weren't any major changes required um, to the tool itself or to the individual flowcharts. So principally the changes that have occurred are actually additions to the tool based on feedback. Um, the first, there are three elements that are kind of more significant than others. And, and the first one is um, the addition of a contingency triage tool. Um, this tool is intended to be pulled out, I suppose, when there are surge attendances to the ED in paediatric patients, uh, which require additional measures to keep everybody safe. And I'll speak about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Uh, the second item is the addition of reference ranges for hypotension in paediatric patients. And as Rory has already alluded to, hypotension is indeed a very late sign in children. And so reference ranges for hypotension were not included in the first edition uh, for reasons that I'll explain further. But based on feedback from users, we have added some now. The third item that's also added is some more education around pain alluded at the start to the challenges in assessing pain in children and how it remains an area of improvement um, in feedback and assessment of the tool. And we have made some additions to try to improve that, which I can um, share with you shortly. There were also some minor adjustments to the flowcharts to ensure generalizability and consistency and the glossary has been expanded too. But for the purposes of this short presentation, I'm gonna to stick to explaining a little bit more about the first three items I've mentioned. Next slide, please. Uh, so I suppose the principle of triage um, dictates that demand for uh, a service or clinicians um, exceeds the supply, because if we didn't have any shortage of clinicians, then we wouldn't actually have any need for triage. Um, and our own emergency medicine program KPI, which has been mentioned already um, a couple of times, is that we are aiming to triage 95% of patients who present within 15 minutes of their registration. Now, this is a challenge throughout the country in all of our emergency departments, in addition to in the paediatric EDs. Um, and in addition to that, we do see in the paediatric population, perhaps in particular, that we do see significant surge presentations um, at particular times of the day or particular times of the year. And these do pose a challenge for those of us who triage uh, to assess these children as quickly as possible to be sure of patients waiting to be triaged, there is no child who is critically unwell who requires immediate attention. So the concept of contingency triage is that a patient assessment triangle is used by an experienced senior staff nurse. Um, and essentially, it's as you see there, it's a clinical tool. It doesn't use any measurements or parameters. It's based on the appearance of the child, their work of breathing, um, on reviewing, and um, their circulation, so the colour of the skin. It doesn't rely on oxygen saturations or indeed on the reference ranges that we use in the normal tool. And this rapid assessment should lead to a preliminary um, categorization into a category one, two, or three. And as you would expect, the category one child requires immediate attention, the category two child requires prompt attention, or at the very least placement in an area where they can be supervised until such attention can be delivered. And the category three child is deemed safe to perhaps go back to the waiting room and await their formal full, excuse me, ICTS triage. Um, there's a recognition that this 
particular skill uh, for contingency triage um, will require additional training, even for those practitioners who are competent in ICTS. And also there is some additional training required around indications to activate use of this tool in the first place. And that will form part of the education package for the second edition. Next slide, please. Uh, the second item I mentioned already is the addition of reference ranges for hypotension in paediatric patients. The table you can see here on the slide is the um, reference ranges which were included in the first edition and you can see they refer just to hypertension. Um, and based on um, the measurement of the blood pressure for a given age, it assisted with the categorization of a child into a high priority triage category of two or three. The focus was on hypertension in the first edition because as we all recognize, hypotension is a late sign in children and generally speaking, by the time a child has got clinically detectable hypotension, we would expect them to have an array of other physiological signs, which would also be mandating high acuity or, or prioritization of that child. However, the user feedback was such that there really was felt to be um, a demand for some guidance around hypotension, even with sort of ballpark reference ranges. So we have gone ahead and added some guidance to this chart in the second edition. If I could have the next slide, please, Pauline. Uh, Carol, uh, something seems to have frozen. Fergal, I can see you're alive. Uh, can you? Uh... So, Pauline, you might get Carol maybe to log out and log back in. And while we're doing that, we might take a question or two. What do you think? Sure, yeah. Fine. Well, yeah. I mean, one of the things that, that struck me listening to it, and, and maybe um, uh, Fergal or Rory might, might deal with this, is what is the application of these uh, triage measures to general practice? Are they, are they useful for, for children who come to general practice uh, with regard to those who need to be you know, call an ambulance and get them to hospital quickly, or, or or is it strictly that they're used for triage within the emergency departments? Maybe I might take that, and Rory might have some supplementary comments. I, I think the, the reality is that this is intended for a situation where you have a number of patients to be seen and you have to decide how they're prioritized. In general practice, uh, the, the overwhelming majority of the patients they see are for routine mundane things. So the proportion of genuine emergencies within that is going to be substantially smaller than the proportion of emergencies attending an emergency department. So I think some of the, the obvious high level principles like, you know, significant hypertension or hypotension or tachycardia or some of the uh, clinical parameters that are mentioned uh, would be ones which should alert a GP to the possibility that they're dealing with somebody who's physiologically deranged and therefore likely to be sick. The, 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 the tool itself is really meant for an emergency department or a hospital type setting, uh, although some of the principles are applicable. Any view on that? Uh, hi everyone, Mike. No, I said... agree. I think Carl's hi. back. Okay, Carl, welcome back. Uh, uh, such are the vicissitudes of the modern era. Indeed, I was in full flow there and it just dropped me like a rock. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I was talking about the hypotension. Shall I finish? Uh, do please. Sure. Uh, so, so essentially, um, the reference ranges for hypotension that we've added uh, come from a paper published by Henrietta Moll's working group in the Netherlands. And anyone familiar with the paediatric emergency literature will be familiar with her work, uh, she's, they're, they're quite prolific. Um, so it's important to recognize that even the paper from which the reference ranges come from speak of the limited utility and I suppose the lack of information around 
the specificity or the sensitivity of um, hypotension, but it does have specificity insofar as it is a predictor of subsequent PICU admission. So we have added them um, to assist with triage, but I suppose our, our fundamental adage about hypotension would always remain the APLS statement, which is really that hypotension in pediatric patients is a pre-terminal sign, and we'd never interpret it in isolation to other signs. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, the third element that we've added, as I said at the start, is a discussion about pain. So the first edition flowcharts do include assessment of pain and assigning a numerical score as part of the way to determine the acuity of a patient at triage. But it didn't contain any education around um, how to choose um, the correct pain scale for the age of the patient. And obviously there are different ones for different ages. So in the second edition, there will be some pieces about uh, use of the FLAC scale for younger children, the Wong Baker faces scale that you can see there for older children, and also uh, the pain ruler. Um, and this will also form part of the education package for the second edition. And next slide, please. So I don't have too much further to go, although I did say I wanted to show some data which we feel uh, demonstrates um, the utility of this uh, ICTS tool. Could I have the next slide, please? So the data was collected over 2014 to 2019. Um, and the next two charts I'm going to show you, um, essentially what it shows is good concordance and correlation between triaging using ICTS in a dedicated standalone paediatric ED relative to a number of mixed EDs around the country. So blue is the paediatric ED, red are the, is the from the mixed emergency departments. Um, and so this slide shows that over time and between um, sites, there's good concordance uh, in assignment of triage categories. Uh, between the PD and the mixed sites. Next slide, please. And this second slide shows the admission rate per triage category. So this looks similar to uh, some of the slides Fergal showed earlier. And again, what this shows is that with the use of ICTS over time and across different sites, you see good concordance um, in assignment of the triage category and the outcome by way of admission, particularly for children in the higher uh, triage categories one to three. Um, I think Fergal did allude to this earlier as well. What we did note is that in the mixed emergency departments regionally, there appears to be a higher admission rate for children in lower triage categories four and five. Now, while we haven't drilled into this in great detail yet, um, an explanation for this may be that on sites where there isn't a dedicated paediatric emergency um, that in order to keep the most children safest, there may be a lower threshold for admission for some children. Um, regionally. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is my final slide, and um, again, you'll recognize this a little bit from Fergal's uh, talk at the start. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, so this is a pie chart which shows the PICU admission rate, and this refers to data from the Pediatric Emergency Department. Um, and what this shows is that children admitted to PICU in that six-year period from 2014 to 2019 the vast majority of them had been assigned a triage category score of one or two at the time of their triage. And this is very consistent over time. And I think um, these last few slides demonstrate that in addition to being a valuable and reliable tool to prioritize patients in the emergency department, ICTS may also have a value as a, a proxy predictor for admission rates for pediatric patients. Um, and I think that this aspect of the tool may be of particular interest to those like Professor Crushell, who are tasked with planning paediatric services um, nationally. And I'd be interested to hear if she had any comments on that. Um, that's everything from me, I think. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions um, as part of the, the Q&A session now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carl. Well, just on that, I don't know if uh, Professor uh, Crushell has any uh, comments to make in follow up to Carol's uh, presentation. Sorry. Uh, you're yeah. mute. Yeah. Oh. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that, those are wonderful talks. Um, thanks to RCSI for hosting it, I guess, and, and all of the speakers and to the Emergency Medicine Programme who, who we met recently with. Um, you've all been very supportive uh, for and, and show a real commitment to paediatric emergency medicine. Um, Carl's talk, uh, that, 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 it was really good to see uh, Carl's talk and, and, and to see the improvements in triage. And it's interesting to note the differences between uh, the paediatric centres and the mixed EDs. 
And I suppose that's one thing that we hope to work towards in the next little while through the, through, with the, as you know, there was a model of care developed for paediatric health services um, a couple of years ago. We're now into the next phase and we're planning the implementation of that. And um, it's great to see the commitment of, of the, obviously the growth and development of paediatric emergency medicine has been obvious in Dublin and it's been wonderful to see and that will continue. And it's great to see a commitment outside of Dublin also um, with appointments such as Rory's and I know that there are others in the offing um, um, towards you know establishing a PEM presence within within mixed units. So that's um, that's great to see. Um, the other aspect, I suppose, is, is uh, the um, PEM, uh, the fact through the Faculty of Paediatrics, we've been um, very supportive of PEM, again, uh, you know, applying for specialty rec recognition through the Medical Council. So we, we hope that that will continue. And we look forward to working with you all in terms of um, the further development of PEM all around the country through the, through the, the chapter of the Medal of Care. And just with my um, surgeon's hat on, what is the role of the acute surgical assessment unit um, in the mixed uh, in setting? Um, because many of our trainees will have had relatively little exposure to paediatric surgical emergencies. I wonder if Carl help with, with this, the surgical piece? Uh, I have to say, I'm I'm not very familiar with whether children are seen in the acute surgical assessment units regionally. Um, I I know that um, in many departments, ch children are seen if they're sieved into medical and surgical streams, then they may be seen by the emergency medicine service first, and then referred to surgery from there. Um, I think Jerry perhaps might be better positioned to uh, to answer that question with his EMP hat on. If I'm not a uh, passing ball too quickly, well, Jerry. <laughs> If I may come in for a second, I've just raised my hand to suggest that Rory O'Brien may actually address that. Rory, would you be there for that? Oh, and, and a quick, I seem to quick be, I have, have ball kicked ball a football that's <laughs> being passed around. Well, the, the issue of paediatric surgery outside of Dublin is a really hot topic at the mm -hmm. moment. But specifically, um, Rory, the issue of children going to acute surgical assessment units, do you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, uh, Look, uh, wh wherever they're best seen. Um, I mean, at at present, certainly in Cork, that's not happening, and they're they're being seen in the emergency department uh, in general. Um, and and I think you you hit the nail on the head around um ex exposure to, um to pediatrics um uh, throughout your training. I think that applies more broadly to all specialties working in regional centres. I mean, in that can you can apply that to anaesthesia. You can apply that to radiology. Um, and you know, it th there might be something uh, to look at in the future through CAC or through other whatever all the mechanisms for um for specialists working in regional centers I, I think um it would be a reasonable thing to have a certain proportion of um you, your your consultants who've undergone some so specialty training because uh, that is an issue and it kind of depends on the day of the week really uh, at the minute yeah, i think the well, challenge I, can I be i guess you, you realize that's why i asked the question yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah. Just on that, there's a question that came in, and and maybe uh, Fiona would would be best placed. When you you have a mixed uh, department, how do you manage the balance of ED nurses who have pediatric experience? The the staff allocation should ensure that there would be a minimum of one RCSN. Uh, registered children's nurse um, on duty at all times and if they don't have somebody with the registration that there should be somebody who has acquired the specialist knowledge and skills relating to paediatrics. It's very challenging. There is a national shortage of children's nurses but we have put in um, a number of training programs nationally to help uh, with the education needs. Uh, there's a foundation program as well as then the postgrads um, and um, you know within the local departments education program they need to ensure that the nurses are uh, the mobility of the nurses is sufficient that they can cover all areas of the departments the greater challenge tends to be the peds nurses coming up to the adult side rather than the um, adult nurses going down to the peds because there's less of the peds nurses so their exposure is then less um, but it's all about you know making sure that your nurses 
um, have sufficient exposure in all areas of the department, whether it's paediatrics, recess, triage, they need all aspects. Thank you. Uh, Kieran Ryan, you wanted to come in. Yes, President, it just, it'd be a, it kind of almost a related question if you want, or, and anybody can take this uh, question, but it's an interesting one um, and probably a general interest. In an emergency department that sees children and adults, should children be prioritised or should they have to wait in accordance with the uh, triage system? Uh, Does that work? I, I, I might take that if you don't mind. Um, I mean, there is a recognition that the younger the child, the greater the risk. It will be practiced in in our department that that where you have uh, a child and an adult with the same triage category, that young children will be seen in in preference because they have the potential, as 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 Rory alluded to, to harbour lots of nasty things which need to be treated sooner rather than later. Uh, I mean, the the way it will generally work is that. People are triaged in in sequence uh, as they arrive. Uh, clearly, if you get forewarning from the ambulance service, that may alter how you deal with somebody coming to your department. But in general, younger children are prioritised for care ahead of an adult of the same triage priority. Now, some of that's achieved by having different areas within the department that you can see and, and different allocations of doctors within the department to see different categories of patients. So streaming contributes to that as well. Uh, can I ask, and this was uh, labelled for Rory, uh, adult and paediatric patients um, often present and are managed differently. How does that apply with trauma, though? I, I mean, if you've got, um, uh, how does the triage work for trauma in children? Um, and uh, you, presumably you're talking about major trauma or any trauma? I, I suppose well, talking well, about I, major I trauma. Suspect, um, I suspect like all of these things, there's a yeah. spectrum. So I Correct, mean, a sprained, yeah. a sprained finger, I wouldn't include, but... Yeah. but um, yeah, look. Um, obviously, like like I alluded to before, there there are um, there's lots of transferable skills. I mean, um, the the first thing to say is that uh, major trauma in children is rare compared to adults. Um, so it is a relatively, you know, it comprises about five percent of total major trauma. Uh, and the other thing to say, um, as regards creating trauma systems, clearly there's a, a fantastic vision in Dublin to create a national children's hospital, and that that. I think that's the way to go. Uh, but the reality is um, that one third to 50 percent of children who end up having a, you know, a major trauma arrive by car. So um, to their local local facility. So I think um, it's incumbent on in all all hospitals that do see children to to have the systems in place, um, but also to have a, a kind of an onward and upward um, pathway to, to get to the hospitals that they, they need to go to. I mean, it's not it's not infrequent that we get a, a head trauma being more common in children. Uh, as a proportion of injury um, and uh, clearly that's a time critical emergency when it happens um, and what, what will often happen is um, children will present to, to our hospital given that we have a, a neurosurgical um, facility here um, however they, they won't be uh, dealing with all, all the, the major issues that occur um, so what we're essentially doing is delaying their 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 final destination really and I think that's uh, something as a as a as a you know, as a group, we, we need to sit down and, and iron these things out better so that um, th that we identify those children sooner and uh, uh, don't delay their 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 ultimate uh, treatment, really. I don't know if that uh, answers your maybe question. Maybe I, I can just follow on that uh, and perhaps Ellen uh, would, would come in on this too. How does this relate to the uh, planned trauma centres? Um, how how does paediatric trauma fit into this uh, into this jigsaw? Sorry, Ellen, you're mute. Oops, no, sorry. Um, so I think the the plan is um, that that the major that, that the Children's Health Ireland will be the one major trauma centre for children. But uh, Rory, uh, feel free to come in on Cork's behalf there. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, Cork yeah, will be a Jerry trauma McCarthy unit. Here. Yeah, and Jerry McCarthy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll I'll pass the ball. Yeah, here you go, catch. Yeah. I 
I thought you, 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 you're already <laughs> going to kill me for a couple of things I've stuck you with this evening. So I could just address that. I think there's an overarching is issue here, which is the amount of sites upon which we are trying to deliver unscheduled care 24-7 of all types. And in CUH, where Rory and I work, there are sufficient children coming in to justify a concentration of a separate paediatric emergency area. So the issue of children being seen in sequence with adults doesn't arise because they're seen in a separate place for about 18 hours of the day. We have a similar challenge with the very elderly. Should we apply the same Manchester triage category to a 95 year old as we do to a 45 year old? So these are all growing issues for us, specifically in terms of trauma. My understanding, having been on the Trauma Network Steering Group, is that it was specifically tasked to develop a system for adult trauma in the hope that the paediatric trauma would be coming along sometime. But obviously, we all know there have been issues <laughs> in the development of that outcome. So the plan would be that there would be perhaps three or four regional paediatric trauma units to which children who did not appear to have suffered major trauma or were too far from Children's Hospital Ireland campus to get there safely, that they would be brought in the first instance. So you wouldn't be bringing all paediatric major trauma to all adult trauma units. You'd be bringing it to maybe four of them. And the earlier challenge that we've spoken of is the match between a surgeon who is comfortable in dealing with paediatric surgery with a paediatric anaesthetist who is comfortable happening to be on coincidentally on the same night. So these are all big challenges ahead of us, but hopefully we're making progress. I, I think the worry, the worrying word there is coincidentally, and that actually goes to the heart of the issue that it cannot be coincidental. And we really have to we have to grasp this nettle because it is a, an issue uh, more, I would have thought, for anesthesiology and surgery than it is for paediatrics. Yes, and I think it's becoming a bigger and bigger concern for paediatricians, but also PEM specialists around the country, this this difficulty. We've been meeting with the surgical pro pro program and the anaesthetic program to see what can be done. But I think it's beholden on all of us to to kind of uh, bring it to the table that the, the next appointments should be people who are interested in paediatric surgery and paediatric anesthesia. Um, I, I, you know, it's probably, a, 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 it's a difficulty, I think, across a lot of the surgical specialties that surgeons have become so specialized. Um, they're, they're, you know, should all of your surgeons be 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 doing six months of pediatric surgery? We, I mean, we would think so, but I know it's not part of the, the, the HST program. Well, actually, it is a topic of discussion and uh, it is an option that is there. Uh, but and uh, it was no more recently than at council last week that we we actually uh, uh, this topic was raised. I, I see Mohammed Ahmed has put up uh, a question about uh, the value of triage systems in mass casualties. I, I presume uh, that if you got a, a school bus or something, you would still uh, and you got 14 or, or 20 children in from a school bus accident. The triage uh, priorities would be this uh, would be implemented in the same way. Um, I, I can make a short response to that if you'd like. Um, I Please. think that might, that might be a situation where we would, in fact, uh, take out something like the contingency triage tool, because with uh, you know a multiple casualty presentation simultaneously, uh, it probably wouldn't be appropriate to take out ICTS um, because it, the nature of the tool is such that there are physiological measurements required in order to triage patients. So the contingency triage tool that we are adding to the second edition, this tool actually had its origins in the pre-hospital environment and uh, is part of the Canadian tool. Um, so something like that may well um, be more appropriate in a mass casualty occasion. Something we're actually looking at locally in Crumlin uh, for our own major incident plan here um, is which tool we would use in that in that particular instance. So I would suggest that, and the others obviously can feel free to agree or disagree with me, but I'd suggest that the contingency triage tool or something along those lines would be most appropriate in that situation. Uh, it's probably, it, Roland, it's probably worth saying that there are um, uh, major, major incidents training courses uh, which have triage as part of them. I mean, they're designed for all comers, obviously.
if you can imagine something like the Manchester Arena bombing, there would have been adults and children would have come from that. So these systems have to be designed and the triage process has to be designed to deal with all comers. I mean, you might be lucky, inverted commas, and get a busload of children of a particular age, but you're more likely in a major incident setting to get a whole range of, of people with a whole range of injuries. Uh, so there are pre-existing triage tools for uh, for pre-hospital care for that purpose. Um, I mean, if you get a, if you get a very specific um, group of 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 pediatric patients, then uh, as Carla suggests, the contingency tool may work at the front door. But there there is a process before that where people should be triaged, sieved before being their destination hospital is decided. There's a question from um, Adrian O'Dowling. What is the general opinion on having an emergency department in the planned children's hospital? Would a GOSH style tertiary referral only centre be preferred? Now, GOSH uh, means nothing to me, but I'm sure uh, it means Grace, something. Grace, or Grace Ormond Street. The, the answer to that is no, it would absolutely not be preferred. <laughs> 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 We you have, have to, it'll be the only place with 24 hour beds in the in the city uh, when it when it opens because the urgent care centers will close at night sorry oh gosh great ormond street okay i got it kieran yeah there's a question here um about why are there differences between the normal age ranges of the observations compared with the pediatric early warning score uh, allegedly, some doctors are preferring to know the uh, early warning score as opposed to the ICTS deviations. There's a tricky one for you now. Yeah. I wouldn't say it's tricky. It's tricky Go enough on, to ask. <laughs> I can speak to that one. Now we, we have ongoing conversations about PEWS. So PEWS is a medical pediatric early warning score, which was developed for use um, on in an inpatient situation. It was never designed to be used in emergency departments um, and it is not validated for use in paediatric emergency department settings or indeed paediatric patients in mixed emergency department settings. It does have some differences in its reference ranges from ICTS, I suppose because they were developed in parallel, although PUSE was developed after ICTS. Um, the difficulty uh, arises or starts to arise when you have paediatric patients who are referred for admission or already admitted but still in the emergency department and um, they're having ongoing observations done and in some um, environments and in some hospitals, their inpatient observations are done on a PUSE chart rather than on um, a regular OBS chart. Um, so the conflict arises uh, if you are an admitted patient in an ED um, and if the staff in the ED are the emergency department staff, they may be using the ICTS reference ranges for normal abnormal. Whereas um, on an inpatient ward, the PUSE reference ranges are slightly different. So um, if, a patient, if a doctor is being contacted, I guess, to review a patient, um, then the in doctors who are used to working in an inpatient scenario may ask for a PUSE score, whereas uh, nurses and staff working in the emergency departments don't generally favour PUSE scores because they're not actually designed uh, to be used in an ED setting. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> And, and, and Carol, just can I add to that? There's there's a general point is that the different tools are used at different points of the patient journey. And we've had this issue in adult practice as well, where there was an assumption that the national early warning score, in other words, the, the news that's used for inpatient surgical patients, inpatient medical patients, would be appropriate in an emergency department setting, even though it was never validated for that purpose either. Hence, there is an emergency medicine early warning score in the same way that there's intensive care unit scoring systems as well, because it's a different environment, it's a different group of patients. So what Carol is describing is the, is the point in the pathway at which the tool applies. So PUSE applies to inpatients, albeit that in many cases they haven't escaped from the emergency department to an inpatient bed, and we have a similar situation uh, with the National Early Warning Score and EMUs, which is the emergency medicine equivalent, which is validated for an emergency department population. Well, all I can say is there is one big benefit of COVID. We would never have had this discussion without COVID forcing us to go online. Uh, 
So I'm I'm very grateful to all our contributors and particularly to Jerry McCarthy and colleagues from the National Clinic Emergency Medicine who put this together at short notice. And thank you all. I've learned a lot. I hope uh, all of our, at one stage, I think 158 people who joined in uh, learned something from it. I certainly have. And I hope that we'll be able to have a similar engagement later on in the year or, or next year. So thank you to all our contributors and thank you for those of you who sent in uh, questions and uh, keep safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Al.